All right. Um, welcome to the General Education System-Wide Transfer Course OER Recommendations. Um, we're really thankful uh, to the KBOR OER Committee um, for helping us put on this presentation for you all today. Um, so our job today is to help you identify um, OER um, that could potentially work in your EG 101 classes. And um, if you have done much um, research in OER, you know that it takes time and effort um, to identify OER um, that can work for your courses. And so our um, hope here today is that um, we can present some OER that could potentially work in in your EG 101 classrooms um, in your colleges. But it is one of the things that the KBOR OER committee really wants to emphasize is that these are simply recommendations. There is no mandate um, that anyone use OER in their EG 101 courses. And of course, all the books we talk about today are just recommendations. Um, you know, none of these are a mandate in any way. And so the committee just really wanted to emphasize that as we are getting started. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, this year um, the committee is uh, working on uh, recommending OER for College Algebra, Composition 1, Elementary Statistics, Introduction to Psychology, and Public Speaking. Um, and so if you have colleagues in those areas, uh, there will be recordings and presentations available over those recommendations as well. We would like to thank the Midwest Higher Education Impact, MHEC, um, because this program has been funded um, by a grant from them. They've been very helpful um, with helping us develop OER in Kansas since we started working with them in 2018. Um, so big thanks to MHEC as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get along with our presentation, um, Selecting English OER for Kansas Classrooms. Um, and I'll let Dr. Dickinson introduce herself. Oh, you're muted, Carrie. Yeah. Hi, y'all. I'm uh, Dr. Carrie Dickinson. I'm the Assistant Director of the Writing Program at Wichita State. Awesome. Um, I'm Dr. Andrea McCaffrey-Wallace. Um, I am our lead uh, online instructor I'm at Butler Community College. Um, and we'll tell you a little bit about our experience with OER as we kind of get into the criteria um, and kind of why uh, we looked at some of the things we did as we were selecting these books. Is this I me? Think, I think this is. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we're going to start um, by just talking a little bit about sort of the initial process and some of the things. That oh, you muted again. I'm so sorry, Carrie. <laughs> oh, it's because I tried to move the slide because I'm used to being able to do that. No, it's okay. Um, Here, I'll, I'll move it for you. I'm so okay. sorry. You excited? Okay, so the committee charged us um, with several criteria, um, including sort of the scope and usability, um, specifically looking uh, at OERs um, that met the KBOR outcomes, um, and then also thinking about things like readability, um, multiple formats, um, accuracy, which for us was not as important as it might be for other fields, um, because, um, you know, as you know, as people who sort of teach in composition, you know, it where our focus is, you know, less on mastering specific um, information than it is on, and like sort of improving writing practices. Um, we're also looking at accessibility um, and cultural relevance. Um, and then also, you know, trying to identify OER that, partic that particularly had sort of activities and ancillaries. Um, once again, I will say that this was not as big of a consideration for us as it is maybe for some other colleagues, uh, you know, composition, we, it, we don't rely necessarily on things like test banks um, or homework platforms, um, but we were cognizant of that and we were looking for that, um, but we didn't find as much of that as we might if we were, you know, looking at sort of psychology or mathematics tests. Um, most of the OER that we found um, were pretty low on those. Um, so um, I'll just since one of the things we were charged with doing, um, with looking at, you know, were the um, the sort of shared 101 outcomes, looking at for OER that uh, addressed the shared OER, the shared 101 outcomes. I'll just go over those briefly. Um, as you probably know, these are fairly general. <laughs> so um, you know, the first outcome, uh, the sort of shared outcome is to employ conventions of format structure, voice tone, and levels of formality. 
to produce writing for specific purposes and audiences as required by various writing situations. Um, so, you know, with this, we were looking for OER that addressed like sort of a broad range of writing assignments and, you know, potentially depending on how the classroom is constructed, rhetorical modes. Um, secondly, uh, the second outcome is to practice ethical means of creating their work by integrating those own their own ideas with those of others. So we were looking at you know OER that may that addressed um, you know incorporating outside sources into students' writing. Um, the third outcome is to demonstrate an ability to fulfill standards of syntax, grammar, punctuation, and other spelling for various rhetorical contexts. So we were looking uh, specifically at like sort of like the grammar. Um, parts and sort of the style and um, mechanical um, content, you know, within these OER. Um, the fourth outcome is to apply the flexible strategies for pre-writing, developing, drafting, revising, editing, and proofreading. So we wanted to make sure that the OER, you know, had discussions about the writing process, um, potentially um, guidelines for peer review, um, which goes with that final outcome, which is to create their own and others' work. Um, and of course, uh, Kiri and I have um, both worked on selecting OER for our own English departments. Um, and so just in selecting and implementing um, OER for, um, for English composition, and we knew that there were specific things that we needed to look at for English Comp 1. Um, one of those was an in-depth discussion of the rhetorical modes. Frequently, composition OER do discuss the rhetorical modes, but a lot of the time it's a much briefer, um, a much more brief section. Um, and so we were looking for a more in-depth discussion um, instead of just like a simple paragraph. Um, we also wanted helpful information on research and citation. Um, grammar content, um, while that's maybe not as important for every level, um, especially in implementing OER at Butler, um, I know having grammar content has been important for a lot of our faculty. And we also looked for example papers. This is something else that can be difficult to find in an OER text. Um, of course, a lot of uh, institutions have their own banks of sample papers that they use. Um, but you know, but we felt that finding something with example papers would make the text more helpful. Um, even though we weren't, you know, even though we were kind of looking at ancillaries, um, one thing that we really wanted were discussion questions and or exercises. Um, those weren't in every OER that we're going to recommend to you today, um, but there are some in a number of them. And then also, um, we're going to talk about this as we get through the presentation, um, but linked or embedded readings. With um, In English 101, we generally have a handbook and a reader. Um, and the handbook is an easier piece to get for the EG 101, um, but truly uh, the reader can be a very difficult piece. Um, and so we were looking at books that had those readings. Um, again, not all of them have readings, but we will know when they did have them. Um, also, uh, just in terms of assessing, you know, what OER might work, um, we are going to talk about what forms these OER exist in. Um, I'm sure you all know, um, but an OER is an open educational resource. So those can exist in many different forms. It could be um, a, like a, a Blackboard or Canvas course, um, or it could be like an actual textbook. Like ours at Butler um, are available as actual print textbooks. Um, and so, you know, if you are thinking about adopting an OER um, for your own classes, um, you know, thinking through uh, what form do you want this OER to be in? Is it going to be an actual book? Um, is it going to exist through an online delivery system? Um, questions like that are important when you're selecting OER. And so we will talk you through, through some of those elements as well. Um, we are going to start with the easier piece, which is talking about the potential EG 101 handbooks. If you have done much research um, into English OER, you know there are a lot of English comp uh, OER out there. Um, and so uh, Dr. Dickinson and I did look at a number of them and really try to narrow it down for you all. Um, and Carrie, if you'd like to start. Sure. So the first one I'm going to talk about um, is Lumen's um, English Composition 1, Rhetorical Methods Based. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you know, with sort of the scope of OERs, um, Lumen is a for-profit company, but it creates 
a lot of OER content. Um, and the way that it makes money is that it will work with particular schools to help sort of tailor that content um, for those schools and integrate them into their, you know, LMSs, whether that's Blackboard or Canvas. Um, but you do not have to subscribe to their services in order to use their content. Um, so it's, you know, there's sort of like two different options. You sort of do it yourself um, and it's free, you know, or you can, you know, sort of pay to have them sort of help you tailor that content. Um, so um, the the book that sort of we felt was the most sort of relevant to sort of the outcomes and the way that Compass approached in a lot of um, the universities um, and community colleges in Kansas um, was this one. Um, so we felt like it was a bait. So it was a good option, especially for those classes that approach composition through the rhetorical modes. Um, I'll also just note that this is the basis for most other composition OERs. So the other books we're going to talk about um, have this content and they have they remix this content and add it with other content for those books. Um, so almost every comp OER that you're going to look at is probably going to have some of this content. So, you know, if you want to start, if one of your goals is to sort of create your own OER, um, this is a good starting point to sort of find that sort of foundational content. Um, but it also works on its own. Um, so some of the pros we found is that it had those chapters on sort of different rhetorical modes. Um, they had some readings, so it had links to some readings, um, and it did have a collection of sample student papers. Um, those readings were fairly limited, um, which is not uncommon um, in the composition OERs. Um, there was no chapter on research, um, which, you know, it might be a problem um, for some composition, for some comp one classes, um, though it does have a, a chapter on using sources. Um, but that's, it's not talking, it doesn't have a chapter that addresses sort of the research process. Um, and it doesn't have any of those activities or ancillary materials or discussion questions or any of that. Um, and as I said before, you know, just one thing to note is that Lumen is for profit. Um, so, it's still, you know, this is still open um, and accessible and sort of can be remixed, um, but that does sort of change a little bit um, about sort of how the materials are given. So there is a, you know, a LibreText version of this um, that students can access, and then there's also a website where you can either direct students or you can copy and paste content out of that website into your own LMS um, or your own document. So those are the two primary ways to access this content. And then the second uh, hand. Carrie, I think you muted again. Sorry. It's because I'm used to hitting the space button. <laughs> it's okay. The, uh, the second one I'll talk about um, is also a Lumen Tech. So this is smaller and this is, this content in this one is also remixed a lot in other comp ones. Um, but this really, the re reason why we included this on the list is that we feel like um, this is a really useful supplement to the other Lumen text. So if you're using that first Lumen text, but there's pieces you're missing, such as the research piece, um, you know, or if you want to, you know, talk about reading strategies and sort of integrated reading, if you're missing, if you want more on that, then there's content in this OER that you can sort of use to supplement that first OER. Uh, so, you know, as I suggested, the pros is that it has chapters on sort of reading strategies, including summary, you know, if you have, if that's an important part of your composition class, um, that also has, you know, chapters on research and the research process and finding sources and evaluating sources, if that's an important part of your comp one class. Um, it doesn't really have any of the other stuff that was in that first one. So it doesn't have readings, it doesn't have sample papers, it doesn't have any discussion of, you know, any other sort of kinds of papers that students might be doing in comp one. You know, and it doesn't have any of those ancillary activities. Um, but it is, you know, we saw we saw this as sort of like if you're doing that, if you're using that first lumen text and you're missing pieces, that this is a good place to go to get those missing pieces. Sure. Um and so then we did look at a few books um, that have been uh, edited and remixed um, by different institutions. Um, and so these frequently have pieces of the Lumen in them um, and other OER as well. Um, but then these colleges have um, built on that. Um, let's see. So this Let's Get Writing um, for Virginia Western Community College. Oh, and by the way, I did want to say in the chat, I dropped the link to a Google Doc um, that Carrie and I have put together. Uh, and it has links to each, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it has links to each um, 
to each of these texts and also our notes on the text that go a little bit more in depth than what we have on the slides here. Um, so do save that Google Doc for future reference. Um, but so Let's Get Writing has a pretty broad range of content. Um, it could work for several approaches to Comp 1. Um, it does have chapters on uh, the rhetorical modes. And um, it does, you know, it goes pretty in depth, uh, ideas on how to structure some of the different modal papers um, and examples of those. Um, it does have a, a chapter, I think it actually has a chapter on research and a chapter on source integration. Um, so it splits those into two. Um, and then this one has, um, this one does have chapters on grammar. Um, and I'm trying to remember really fast, um, so this one has a chapter on developing sentences, punctuation, and then choosing words. Um, so it isn't just paying lip service to the kind of grammar. It does go pretty in-depth and cover um, some of the different things that we cover in our EG 101 courses. Um, it does have sample papers for every mode. Um, and it does have exercises and activities um, kind of embedded within, it's not that it's super high tech, you know, it's just like discussion questions and different exercises, but it does at least have those questions um, so that your faculty aren't having to develop that on their own. Um, Let's see. And then, um, so one of the problems I have with this book is that um, there aren't very many chapters. I think there's maybe only 10, but when you get in there, those pages just go on forever. Um, and right, they have a little introductory section at the top of each chapter. And right after that is a small little table of contents you can click on to link to the different sections. But I think a student might kind of overlook that and be stuck just scrolling. That happened me the first time I looked at the book. Um, in my mind, this is something I would probably cut and paste and make a little more wieldy um, for my students to handle. Um, there were also some broken reading links. They did have some links to readings, um, but it wasn't too, too much. Um, so those were some of the uh, things with Let's Get Writing. We also looked at Writing for Success um, by McLean. As the note on the bottom there says, there is another version of this text um, by Weaver with slightly different content. Um, if you're not familiar with OER, this happens pretty frequently where you'll have one text and then someone takes that text and then does some changes to it, right? And kind of makes it their own edition. Um, one of the reasons that um, we liked this is that it has a lot of useful content for developmental writers. Um, it does have a chapter for multilingual writers um, on different, you know, common mistakes that ESL students make. Um, I actually, this chapter for multilingual writers, we have adapted this in our own 101 textbook um, for our ESL chapter. Um, so, you know, this, this is content that I, you know, I personally use in my classes. Um, this one does include exercises and activities, and I believe this one is the one let's see one of these has self-check activities and I think so, you know Andrea I think and I'm, I could be wrong but I think that because I went back and looked and I think that the text by Weaver has the self-check oh, okay the yeah one doesn't so that, that's one of those places where if you're interested in this text you may go check both those versions um, and just see which one has that specific content because some of them have diff slightly different features and you know yeah. just to check that and see which features are most useful for you or which you might want to sort of remix and draw on for your text class for sure. Yeah, because the self-check feature I thought was pretty cool because the questions are embedded in there and the student can say what they think the right answer is and then the system will just tell them. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, instead of you having to grade a quiz, the students can kind of take them through the self-check stuff. Um, there weren't any readers in this one, um, but again, it's pretty in-depth on the rhetorical modes. Um, I believe this one has three different chapters on research. It has finding sources, writing the research paper, and then citations. Um, and especially for those of us, you know, that teach writers that need a little more help with research papers, having that chapter on actually how to put together a research paper, you know, how to draft it, things like that, um, you know, that's that's pretty helpful. Um, so especially, you know, I would say for my community college uh, colleagues, um, you know, this one is a pretty good one for our students. And I'll just jump into and say that those last two texts we talked about, um, those are all available, you know, either within Libra text, which I believe all the KBOR schools subscribe to at this point. Um, uh, 
also it's they're all available as sort of press books online ebooks and I they're both also available as just straight pdfs so if you want to just have a pdf that you put in your you know lms your blackboard your canvas shell um, or that you you know even have your bookstore print out and sell to students for just the cost of printing you know those are sort of fairly low tech that's a low tech option if you want students to have that sort of like paper book um, in hand so those are potential options as well for sort of formats of those books yeah for sure okay so am I introduce no I think you you're introducing am I doing this one oh, okay I'll yeah. do this transition slide um so now on to the more uh difficult yet exciting right part um of figuring out uh let's see OER for EG 101 and that is the readers right Carrie and I are not going to pretend that putting together a reader for your EG 101 class um is straightforward um because there really aren't just good grab and go options um and so we'll um, but th yeah, so that's what we're going to get into here, are just some potential options. Um, but first, we're going to talk about kind of our own processes in building readers, um, yeah. and which will maybe help some of you think it through. Yeah, so both Andrea and I, when we sort of sat down to develop readers for our classes, um, we weren't happy with the readers that existed. And um, so we both in each of our own programs sort of created our own. Um, so we're just gonna talk you through sort of what we did. Um, and then we'll talk about some existing options that might work well for you, even if they didn't work well for us. Um, so what we did at Wichita State is I use LibGuides, which is you know a common um, application that almost all libraries <laughs> have access to, um, to build a collection of readings. And so what we did is we just, um, sort of linked out um, to either open source reading, so sources that were available on the internet that were free and available on the internet, um, or to readings that were um, available through our library. So that were behind a uh, paywall, generally speaking, um, but that students could access for free through our library services. And this was a lot of, you know, maybe magazine articles like, you know, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, um, but also, you know, op-eds published in places like, the, you know, The New York Times, The Washington Post, um, especially since um, we were specifically looking for their short argumentative pieces. Um, so um, the, the benefit to this is that we could sort of control the content so we could add whatever sources we want. We weren't dependent on someone else to sort of add those and vet them um, and sort of decide sort of what they thought made sense for the class because we could pick what was we thought was useful for our students in our class. Um, but because we're linking out to readings, um, you know, we're also sort of dependent on the internet being stable. So those sources can disappear or the links um, can go down or the links can become broken. Um, also because we're just directly linking to sources um, and to readings, the sources aren't being contextualized for students. So, you know, teachers have to sort of do that, that own work for themselves, you know, as far as sort of like telling students, you know, like what was sort of like, you know, who, who is this person? What is this publication? You know, what is sort of the larger context that they're writing within? Uh, and I'm just gonna briefly share a screenshot of what this looks like on our end. Um, so you can see that, so this is, you know, LibGuides, Wichita State University Libraries, and you can see on the left, um, we sort of broke out the readings by topic. Um, so, you know, there's, after sort of that introductory content, like the home, the table of contents, um, we have topics like the humanities and higher education, the purpose of college, the student debt crisis, bias and technology. So these are sort of, you know, topics that we have identified as potential topics to be used in classes um, or that students might be interested in sort of investigating on their own. And then on the sort of middle of the page, you see the links to the reading. So the links with that red padlock, um, those are indicate links that um, are, you know, that students need to enter their WSU credentials for, you know, so that first one, you know, is a, um, a sort of a longer sort of piece in the Atlantic Monthly, you know, what sort of college sort of good for, right? And this one, the article, you know, the, the author is arguing that college is a big waste of time and money, you know, so students might read that and then we encourage them to push back against that, right? And think about, okay, what is this argument? You know, what is the structure of the argument, you know, and, you know, how do you as a person who's chosen to go to college, right? How do you respond to this? You know, sort of engage with it that way. Um, but if you scroll down, Right, you can see that we um, also, you know, have like, you know, linked out to, you know, an article um, in higher education today, right, about, you know, um, you know, historically black, you know, colleges and black women and STEM success. And we also have linked out, um, you know, a uh, sort of a more sort of informational piece by the Q Research Center, you know, so these are all 
Um, you know, so those are both sort of free and available on the internet. And so students don't necessarily need a paywall, don't, don't need their WSU credentials to get to those. So this is how sort of we approached um, the reader to sort of give us the flexibility um, to sort of, uh, you know, sort of include what we wanted. And I will just say that the inspiration came for this because the reader we were using, um, we discovered that students were paying $100 and that all of the articles in it were either free on the internet or in our library database. And so we just didn't see the point in having students spend $100 to pay for material that they could access for free, um, especially since a lot of our students weren't buying the textbook because, you know, they couldn't afford it. Um, and so having access to those materials for free, you know, increased sort of the chance of student success in the classroom because they were having access to that. They were able to engage in class readings. They were able to complete the assignments. So that's how we approached it. Um, and of course, at Butler, we have a different student population. Um, and so our reader um, process was different from Wichita State's. Um, we really wanted to have a print book, right? And I should say, too, we started our OERs at Butler in 2018. Um, and so it was before COVID, right? Post-COVID, our students have become much more tech savvy. Um, they're more used to doing things online. And so now we don't have as many students buying our print book. Um, but even since 2018, with just our comp one, comp two, and then our new intro to lit OER, we've saved students over $3 million um, just at Butler. And we're definitely, you know, we're not a giant institution. Um, I mean, you know, in terms of community colleges, we're not little, um, but, you know, we're not a giant university. And so, um, you know, and that's just a couple of faculty members doing that. So, you know, I think $3 million, you increase student success, you take down barriers. Um, but so for ours, we really worked to find readings that were in the public domain or with proper licensing so that we could print them in a book, right? A lot of the um, text that, that Carrie's talking about, students can link to them, but you can't print them in a book. Um, and so we did, you know, we already had a lot of readings from the public domain in our 101 reader, um, you know, things like Helen Keller and Frederick Douglass and Plato. Um, and so we put some of that historical stuff in there but especially as the open access um, movement has taken off, you can find more and more publications that are in the public domain. Um, so we use things from like uh, the public domain review, uh, plus one, things like that. Um, so we, and then we built pre-reading and post-reading questions for each selection. I should say too, one of the things we loved about putting our reader together is that we could format our reader so that it was good for our students that struggle with reading. Um, we have one and a half spacing in that reader so they actually have room to annotate. We made the margins bigger so they have space to make their own notes, right? Um, we have a section at the beginning of our reader teaching them about annotation with a sample annotated essay. And so we were able to really do the things in our reader um, to support our students uh, that really our traditional textbooks were not doing, right? Um, so we do have about a 100 page reader in our book now. Uh, when we started, it was closer to a 200 page reader. Now I do have a Canvas module where I do link additional readings through the library and internet like Carrie does as well. Um, that is like a supplement to our bigger textbook. Um, and so Carrie and I have provided links for both of ours in that document we sent you all. And I do have to apologize. When I checked my link, I realized ours doesn't have our reader in it um, because one of our readings, actually the licensing got kind of weird on, Discovery bought a plus one blog. And anyway, it's a long story. Um, but if you want that file, feel free to email me and I can send it to you. But our file should be updated on our website in a week or two. Um, but so one of the pros is that our readings are contextualized and they're available in print. So if students are having internet issues, they still have that reading. Um, and then the cons, though, are that it really did take more front end work to prepare the text. We're fortunate we did have some money at Butler, so we did get paid for those hours. Um, but, you know, there, there is that front end work to do the pre post reading. I did just want to show you all some screenshots of ours so you can just see it does look like a real textbook, you know, um, we have the introduction to the text, which we're so used to seeing. We do also put pre-read, we try to put pre-reading questions in there for everyone to kind of help direct students, especially if it's a tougher text. Um, here's some of our post-reading questions we have for Keller. And so again, you can kind of see Douglas picks up right at the bottom of that page. Um, we have some TED Talks in there. Um, TED 
TED Talks are, um, you know, just attribution, um, non-commercial license. So you can reproduce TED Talks in your textbook. Um, here's, this is a more contemporary piece um, that we got from the Public Domain Review um, that's kind of a higher level um, talking about Frankenstein and climate refugees. Um, so I think we've been able to put together a decently diverse set of readings for our students from historical to more contemporary, trying to really cover the rhetorical modes as well as argumentation. Um, and we have a section on literature at the end of our reader as well. Um, I know we're running short on time, but we're going to try to run you through these other two general readers um, that, that we've uh, sourced from as well. Yeah, so I'll talk about um, this one. So this is another Lumen text. And, uh, you know, again, like, many, a lot of what you'll find out there sort of references back to this and links back to this. Um, and this is if you're trying to find a starting point for a reader, an open source reader, um, this is one of sort of the best options out there, I would say. Um, so it has a wide range of readings organized by topic. Um, it has several readings on each topic, um, but these topics are fairly general. They're things like the environment um, or the economic crisis, you know, so they might not be as sort of detailed and the conversations that um, the sources might not necessarily be talking to each other in the way that you might want them, depending on sort of how you structured your class. Um, some of the readings are dated. Um, you know, that's, I mean, that's going to happen in any book, <laughs> but, you know, it's certainly true for this. Um, and once again, the readings aren't contextualized for students. So there's no piece that sort of explains, it gives any sort of historical context for the authors, um, you know, or sort of what was, what the situation that reading is sort of responding to or who the authors are talking to in that reading. Um, and then, you know, there are several versions of this, you know, there's a LibreText version, and then there's also just, you know, a website. Um, and the LibreText version, there is some sort of YouTube content in this reader, and the LibreText version, the YouTube content, I, as far as I can tell on my computer, wouldn't load. Um, so that might be just sort of one thing to keep in mind. Um, but this is, you know, if you are starting this process, and you want just sort of a starting point, you know, this, this is sort of a, a one, I think, a good starting point, you know, for looking at what sort of what's available and what's out there. For sure. Um, and then 88 Open Essays, um, this is one that we used to build our reader. Um, this has lots of different open source readings that illustrate argumentation. Um, so uh, this one is not organized by topic or anything like that. It's just kind of a collection. And um, this was really helpful for me when we started putting together our reader, though, because, you know, it will tell you where it was published. And so even if you don't like that essay, then you can backtrack because now you have have yet one more title of an open source publication um, that you can then use different articles from. Um, one thing I do really like about this reader is that the readings are diverse. Um, they have editorials, they have academic articles, and many of the readings still work to illustrate the modes. Um, like one of our better comparison contrast readings that we have in our 101 book currently came from these ADA open essays. Um, but again, the readings are not contextualized. They're not going to have pre and post reading questions. Um, you get the title, you get a tiny bit of publication and licensing information, and then it's straight into the text. Some of the formatting is a tiny bit funky at times too, um, depending on which version you're using. This does exist as a Google Doc, as a press book, and as a Libra text. Um, but I think it can be a good starting point um, along with the Lumen reader if you're trying to piece together your own reader. Um, I think both of these, uh, you know, really have quite a bit of content where, where that make for good starting points. Um, and really, that's about everything we have to share with you all today. Um, we thank you all so much for your time. We did put together a Google Doc um, with links to the resources we talked about and some of our notes. Um, and Dr. Dickison and I are happy to answer your all's questions or chat with you. Um, I'm going to check in the chat here really fast. Um, I don't see any questions, um, but we're also happy to talk to anyone via email um, if anyone has questions. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And um, that way, if people have questions, they feel like they can't ask on the recording, we can get to it. Um, but thank you all again so much for your time.